Well, thank, thank you, you so much. much. And it's, it's an, an honor, honor to be here. here. It's a nice group. It's a nice group. <laughs> we just left Pennsylvania. We had a big rally and a big speech. And I said, OK, that's it for the day, right? No, sir, you're going to DC now. Congratulations. So it's, uh, but it's uh, what I heard. Exactly, exactly the group, the group I knew it anyway, but when they reminded me this was it, this is so important, the job you've done is incredible, really, and it's, it's an honor to be here. Thank, thank you. you. Mr. President, we just want to say how thankful we are that you're doing okay. What a scary day that was in Pennsylvania, and you are looking great, and we're so happy that you were able to join us. You and I were talking a little bit backstage, and you were sharing with me a lot of the concerns you have about the border yeah. and what you're seeing happen with illegal immigrants across the United States. And I thought I'd give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about that to start off. Sure, because uh, you're talking about moms and you're talking about family, such a big factor for you, just about everything. And when you look at what's happening in our country, this is... It's so tough. You know, it's one thing you don't drill oil or you don't do something that you can do with a new group coming in, but uh, millions and millions of people, 21 million people, I think the real number is that you hear 13, 14, 15, like, that's not a big number, but it is, but 21 million people. And many of these people are criminals. Many of these people are coming out of uh, the roughest countries in the world. And they're coming from all over the world. They're not just coming from... South America, you know, everyone thinks they're coming from, like, Guatemala, El Salvador. Uh, they're coming from Mexico. They're coming from everywhere. Uh, I was speaking to the Border Patrol. They said in the last 12 months, 159 different countries were represented by people having come in illegally. And that's some number. But uh, these are tough people. They're coming out of the jails. They're coming out of the mental institutions. Uh, they're, they're coming, coming out of prisons, and uh, they're, they're coming, coming, I mean, they're just coming out of, there's a difference between a prison and jail, it's subtle, but I say that they come out of mental institutions and insane asylums, there's a difference there also, and uh, they're coming into our country at levels that nobody's ever seen, and I've been saying for two years that this has got to stop, I've been saying for longer than that, but for... Two and a half, three years, I said this has to stop, and now it's catching up with us. And you see what's going on in Colorado. I don't know if anybody got to see Aurora. I mean, they're taking over the city. They're taking over apartment complexes. These are young, very tough people. These are tough. They make our criminals look nice. That's the only thing good about them. Our criminals are like nice people by comparison. And uh, if you saw the Colorado thing, and this is happening all over, it's just not Colorado, but... The, the Colorado thing caught the imagination because there were many of them with the biggest weapons that you've ever seen. And these came from Venezuela, which is emptying out all of its criminals. You know what? Venezuela crime is down like 72% because they're bringing all of their criminals from Caracas and everywhere else. They're bringing them to, to the beautiful USA. Thank you very much, Venezuela. We appreciate it. And we're allowing it to happen because we have open borders. And again, this is happening with uh, every continent. We have Africa, well represented, coming out from the Congo. 22 people came in recently from the Congo. Where do you come from? We come from prison. What did you do to get into prison? We will not tell you bad stuff. And we have them here. No intention of bringing them back. None whatsoever. And they're all over the country. But now what they're doing, you know, if you think 21 million, so if you say a, a certain large percentage of them are bad, because when you empty out your prisons and you empty out your mental institutions, it's a lot of people. It's bigger than most armies are in our country, if you add them up totally. So we had 159 countries, let's say. But we have massive numbers of people. And what happened in Aurora today is incredible because they basically have just taken over a swath and the building and they, the people are petrified. The people living in the building, they're leaving. And when they tell the police about it, I mean, the police, you know, they don't need uh, AK-47s. That's a very powerful weapon. 
I, I learned a lot about weapons over the last uh, six weeks. I <laughs> There's a big difference between different weapons. But they're coming in with very powerful weapons. And the police, you know, you have a few policemen that are saying, wait a minute, we're totally outnumbered. Plus they have guns that are, you know, many times the power of what we carry. We don't carry rifles and machine guns and things like that. Wielding around pretty freely and know how to use them. And this is affecting our schools because we want to talk about schools. And they're taking over schools. We have MS-13 gangs. They're the toughest gangs, they say, in the world, probably are. I got them out by the thousands. I took them out by the thousands. Obama couldn't get them out because the country wouldn't allow them to come back in. They were putting airplanes, big airplanes on the runway so you couldn't land the planes and have to come back to the United States loaded up with these same people that they were supposed to take out. And I got them to take them by stopping aid. $750 million to different countries. And I won't go through this too much, but basically I said, uh, how much money do we pay to Guatemala and to a few other countries? And the number was $750 million, which is a lot, but it's not that much. We give so much money away, it's so crazy, to countries that hate us. By the way, we give a lot of money away every year to Afghanistan. Billions and billions of dollars. And I think that uh, Harris, and by now it was starting out by Harris, a Marxist, she's a Marxist, by the way. But people are finding that out. Uh, she's, a total, she's a total Marxist. Her father's a Marxist. He's a Marxist professor. He uh, teaches, uh, I guess, the economy from a Marxist perspective. And he taught her well. But uh, when you look at what was happening, you couldn't get the people out. And when I said, you're going to get these people out of here, the general came to me and said, they won't take them back. Who won't take them back? The countries from where they came. And they would put airplanes on the runway. They'd block up the bus routes. They'd block up everything. So we'd bring them back. And you couldn't bring them back, Tiffany. So it's such a horrible thing. And I said, how much aid do we pay them, sir? We pay them $750 million combined. I said, that's a lot of money, that's a lot. Well, tell them we're not paying them anymore. It's effective immediately. Yes, sir. And they told them that. And the following morning, I come into the beautiful Oval Office, that Resolute Desk, which is so beautiful. You know, now Biden goes around using that. He didn't even know the name of the Resolute Desk. Now he tells me, I sit behind the Resolute Desk. He doesn't even know what the hell it is this time. That's a beauty. Boy, I tell you, did they take a, did they do a coup on him? Anyway, so uh, I said, uh, tell him that's not happening. So the following morning, I get to the office and I get a call from three countries, let's not use names, and all very smart leaders. I'd be doing the same thing if I were them to tell you the truth. That's saying, I empty up my prisons, dump them into the United States, don't ever let them back. And I would be doing it every bit as much as them. I don't blame them if they can get away with it, but they shouldn't be able to get away with it. So I said, uh, you're not going to get the money. They called me up. They say, sir, I understand. And I know all, all three of them. I know all of them. I know all the leaders. They're all at the top of their game. And we have a bunch of dead weights, OK? We are being taken advantage of as a country so much. I've never seen anything like it. So they said, essentially the same conversation, sir, good morning, sir. I understand this problem, sir. You have to understand, this has gone on for 10 years. They wouldn't take their people back. They wouldn't take MS-13 back. They dumped them in our country, wouldn't take them back. I said, well, you know, you're setting them up in the caravans and other ways, and you're not taking them back. You're never getting any more money from the United States. Sir, sir, we would like to take them back. We would love to have MS-13 back with us. We think it's such wonderful. Anyway, they made it very easy for us to get them back, and we took them back by the thousands, and we took also a lot of others back. And uh, then these clowns took over the country, and nothing, everything closed up. And by the way, they're paying them now $4 billion, I understand. Can you believe it? And they don't take them back. It's just so sad to see what happens. They're paying much more money than uh, I was talking about. They raised it. They actually felt it was good to pay them more. They said, why? They said, economic development. It's not economic development. It's 
the development of a dictator because they keep the money. They're not doing any economic development. We have the dumbest people in history running our country. Okay? The dumbest in history. And we have to get... And we have to get these people. So we brought it back at all. But, but what's happening to our country, our country is being poisoned. Poisoned. And your schools and your children are suffering greatly because they're going into the classrooms, they're taking disease, and they don't even speak English. It's crazy. And we have our people that aren't going into a classroom. We have students that were there last year. They aren't allowed into the school this year. They're not allowed. It's crazy. We have our veterans sleeping on the streets, and we have illegal immigrants coming into our country living in luxury hotels above where the veterans are. It's so reverse of what it should be. So I know you love New York City. I'm from New York originally. My dad grew up in Brooklyn and Flatbush. Yeah, New York. Um, but like many other cities in America right now, it's a city in decline. You were in New York when Mayor Giuliani really right. did great reforms. Yeah. He was such a great man. And, uh, you know, he also fought for a lot of things that he should have. Hey, he was right about the laptop from hell. You know, he was the one that came out. Rudy was right. Rudy was right about a lot of things. You know, they have a hat. Trump was right about everything. But well, Rudy was right about a hell of a lot. He was right. He got. He was the first one to see the laptop, I guess. And he revealed what was up there, and everyone hit him hard. He's actually a very brave guy. But he was a great mayor, and he took over the city when it was in really bad shape and very dangerous. And he made it the safest big city in the country. He made it beyond that. It was a vibrant city. And now it's got tremendous problems. And, and in all fairness, look, you have hundreds of thousands of illegal migrants here. How do you do it? You can't run it. I, I read where they're spending billions of dollars. I thought New York had no money. And yet they're spending billions of dollars of money, and it's not given by the federal government. So how are they doing this? The city is suffering, and they're all suffering. No city can take it when you think that 21 million people came into our country. That's bigger than New York. 21 million people came into our country. No country can take that. Nobody can withstand that. It's going to bring us down. And in addition to that, many of these people are hard criminals. And we have to get them out. And we're going to have deportation at the level, at the highest level we've ever had. As a, a higher level, you know, the highest deportation was a pretty moderate guy, but Dwight Eisenhower, he hated that our city was, uh, that our country was being swamped. And Dwight D. Eisenhower, president of the United States, a good president, good general, he won because he's a general. And you know, generals, by the way, are a little statistic. So of the presidents, 92% were politicians, and 8% before me, 8% were generals. And then I came along. And I don't think no, I don't think any rich guy will ever do it. They look at Trump. They say, I don't know. They all wanted to do it. They said, if Trump can do it, I can do it. I can do it. But they see what you have to go through. They say, you know, maybe I won't give it a shot. So let's talk a little bit about family, because we really feel at Moms for Liberty that family and parental rights are under attack in America. All of America got to meet your granddaughter Kai at the Republican National Convention. It's very obvious that you love being a father and a grandfather. Um, so I'd love to know why you choose and continue to choose to work with your children in business and politics. And do you have any advice for people with working with your kids? Well, I've always liked it. I don't know that I'll be doing it very much politically because I think it's been very unfair to them. Like, Ivanka was a great... She, she could have done anything. Great student, a great, beautiful girl, beautiful every day. She was a perfect... Person worked hard. She, you know, she gave up. Do you remember the Ivanka line? I loved those shoes. Please she, tell your daughter. She made great she shoes. She was making so much money with that thing. I say, what the hell is going on? It was so hot. And then I ran for politics. And the truth is, she wanted to come. She, she pretty much gave it up. She, it was really good. Great shoes. Great everything. Very stylish. And a lot of people still talk about it. But she gave it up because she wanted to go, and, and she didn't 
want something like the United Nations Secretary. I wanted her to do that. I said, you would be a great uh, ambassador to the United Nations, United Nations Secretary. You, there'd be nobody to compete with her. I tell you, she may be my daughter, but nobody could have competed with her, with her rat tat tat, the whole deal she's got. And, and she said, Daddy, I don't want to do that. I just want to help people get jobs. And she would go around, not a glamorous job, but she felt so good about it. She would go around to see Walmart, to see Exxon, to see all these big companies, to hire people. And she had hired like millions of people during the course of her stay. And I mean, always there was nothing ever good. It was just very tough. I think, I think if she were a Democrat, Democrat, it would have been... It's, it's much, much easier to be a Democrat, let me put it that way. Apparently, you don't have to take any interviews. That's right, you don't, have to, you don't have to do anything. We saw that the other night. And you won't see too many more interviews, and I have a debate coming up with this one. And she didn't, she didn't want a debate. She didn't want a debate, they were not happy about it, but they got the network that they wanted. This network is the worst of all. Uh, George... Slavadopoulos, you know. <laughs> but they are the worst in, in terms of that. So they wanted the network. And you know, it was like with Biden. They came to me, they wanted to do a debate. I said, uh, isn't it a little bit early? Like, you know, we just started. Do you want to do it now? Yes, so yes. And they thought that if they said it was going to be Dana Bash, who last night was extremely easy. She, there, was, there was no, like... Why aren't you doing this? Or why didn't you say a thousand times that there'll be no fracking in Pennsylvania and then all of a sudden say, oh, we'll have fracking? It felt like a multiple choice quiz. You would give her like several answers that she could have given. They were feeding it to her. I was surprised, actually. I mean, I was surprised she didn't uh, do a lot of interviews, but she's not good at it, I guess. And they knew that. They knew something that we didn't know. I think she would have been better off if she just did interviews, even if they weren't great. It would have been better than because now everyone's watching and now we see. She's defective. She's a defective person. And we don't need another defective person as president of the United States. We just had that. I've heard you talk about your mom in interviews before. She was obviously a very strong woman. Um, was she hard on you with school? Tell us about your mom a little bit. No, she wasn't. She was a great. I had a great mother, great father, very different people. My mother came from Scotland. And she came over to this country. Is it other people from Scotland? Like, you know, actually, that's hidden. Do you know that some of the biggest, smartest, most brilliant leaders in business come from Scotland, and nobody knows it? Or at least, you know, their parents came from Scotland. But it's, Scotland, Scotland did very well in this country. I tell you, it's very, like, we have people, and I know that one group, they're very successful group. No, she came from Scotland, a great place, and she came over just for the summer, and uh, she was 19, I guess, and she met my father, and they had a very long marriage. I said, I'll never top you that, Pop. You know, you always want to be a little bit better than your father, if you can, a little more. And my father loved that. You know, some fathers don't like it. When you have a father that doesn't want his son to be a success, well, you got a problem with a father. But there are plenty of them. I've seen plenty of them that make it actually hard for the son. But no, I had the opposite. I had a father that loved what was happening. But they met. They fell in love. They got married. And they were married for six and a half decades. Wow. A long time. I said, Pop, I'm not going to be able to be here with her. But anyway, they had just a great marriage. Very different people. But they had a great marriage. Very, very strong marriage. So, so I want to talk to you a little bit about The Apprentice. Okay. Um, we talk a lot at Moms for Liberty that we're in the middle of a cultural revolution in America. People like to be dismissive and say it's a culture war, but truly the culture is being changed. I look at you as a president and perhaps our next president, hopefully our next president. That's right. You are a cultural icon. So you had The Apprentice. It ran for, am I right, is it 14 seasons? 14 seasons, 12 years. Ago. We had, uh, actually, one season where it was run for three times during the season. That means they liked it. But uh, 
but it was basically 12 years and, and uh, 14 seasons. So. How do you think you kept the audience that long? Well, it just worked. I mean, we had um, Mark Burnett is great, producer. He did Survivor. And he came to me and uh, they rented the Walman Rink. He wanted to rent it for the finale of Survivor. So it had like this uh, jungle setting facing New York City, right in the middle of Central Park. It was gorgeous, it was beautiful. And he invited me, I didn't know, but he was a young producer. He was the producer of the Survivor. And it was hot because Survivor was a very successful show in CBS. And I went there, I said, wow, well, this is great. I rented him the, the ring, so I wanted to see it also, but he invited me, I went there, watched the show. And he said, I really invited you because I have a concept of a show. And it's sort of Survivor uh, with the asphalt jungle aspect of it, right? The Apprentice. And he told me, and I said, wow, that's interesting. He said, I'll only use you. There's nobody else I want to be to do it. If you don't do it, I'm not going to do it. So I thought about it. And I had an agent from a very big agency. And he said, don't do it. You don't do it. There's never been a business show in history that's been successful. Business shows are not successful in prime time. There's never been, I guess, a business show successful. I said, well, this isn't really a business show. It's a sort of a different kind of a show than a business show. It's got a little business to it, but really it's more than a business show. He said, don't do it. He was a very respected guy, actually. He was a good guy, but he told me not to do it. Don't do it. And then I made the deal with ABC. And the deal was done. And then Eisner, you remember Eisner, previous guy a while ago, uh, he's heard about the deal and he broke the deal. He said, I can make a better deal than that, so let's make a better deal. And I got angry about it, and so did Mark Burnett. And everybody wanted us, they wanted us. So we got a call from Jeff Zucker, of all people, from, uh, at the time, from NBC. Then he was heading up NBC. They were having a real drought. They hadn't had a top 10 show in a long time. And they were not doing well, and I never forget, we walked into his office, he took the key out of the door, and threw it under the chair in Rockefeller Center. He locked the door, he said, you're locked in, we're not gonna leave the room until we have a deal. So we made a deal, and uh, ABC was not happy about it. Actually, the man from ABC that made the deal with us, top person, I think like the president, uh, he quit over this, and uh, he quit. He said, we made a deal with these people, and he was second guessed by Eisner, and he actually quit. And a lot of, there was a lot of anger about it, but we made a deal with NBC instead of ABC. We did have the original deal with ABC. Anyway, it goes on television, and the first week it was like at number 10, which is uh, very, very hard. And by the way, the agent told me, you've got to break the deal. You're going to be embarrassed because you're going to have a total failure, and you're going to be embarrassed. So it goes on, it opens at 10, which is amazing. And NBC was happy because now they have a top 10 show. And then it went through various things like number eight, number seven, it got progressively better. And it finished up as the number one show on television. I'm sitting there, can you believe this? Um, I mean, you remember, it was just like, I watched The Apprentice, we love the show, yeah. The finale actually had of that season at 42.5 million, it was second to the Super Bowl. It was always the Academy Awards and we beat the Academy Awards. Since then, the Academy Awards has gone to hell. It's incredible. You know why? Because all they do is, you know, political stuff. What a, they destroyed it. But, uh, so, it finished up. And number one, and I'll never forget, and I enjoyed it. I said, I had the number one show. And I didn't even have an agent. And so, I get a call from the agent. I'll never forget, six o'clock in the morning, he called me. He says, I want to congratulate you. Show's number one. I said, yeah, it is. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. He said, uh, could I come over and see you? I said, why? He said, so we could work out a fee. I said, you told me not to do it. There's no way I'm paying you a commission. You told me not. They wanted to get a commission. I said, there's no way. I said, if it was up to you, I would have never done it. I got the number one show. You said I couldn't make it. So there's a little, little things. But it, it was successful for years. It just, it just did well, and then around 
the 13th, actually the 12th season, they put me into a poll with a real stiff named Mitt Romney, totally stiff. This guy's bad news. He, he's worse than a rhino. And, they, they, and he was running. And they just put me into a poll. I think it was NBC. And I, I was watching the, uh, I was watching Meet the Press, actually. And with Sleepy Eyes Chuck Todd. Did you ever hear of that? He's a sleepy guy, isn't he? Sleepy Eyes. Another beauty. So, so they put me into a poll. And in the poll, I go to number one. I'm ready at number one. Romney's a distant second or third. And I, they, I was in various polls, and, all, and I kept saying, you know, I'm always just like rated number one. And I wanted to get out, but I couldn't get out of the contract because I had an apprentice. Plus, I had two buildings that I was finishing. I wanted to get them finished. Not good when you don't finish them, rely on somebody else you don't want to do. But I said, you know, maybe if I have a chance, I'll do it the next time. And I did it the next time I ran. And we had 17 people. It was a rather violent uh, series of debates, if you remember, right? Rosie O'Donnell. Only Rosie O'Donnell. That was a tough one. Huh? Only Rosie O'Donnell. You've said this and that. I won't use the terms. You've called women this and that and that. And a lot of it was show business related. I said, only Rosie O'Donnell. And the place went crazy. And the second question I got was Brett Baer. He said, this was a Fox one. And he said, uh, please raise your hand if you will not support the winner of the group of 17 people, whoever wins the nomination. So I raised my hand. I was the only one. I said, I can't say for sure I'm going to support. I don't like certain other people. I don't know them. A couple of them I do. Do you remember that? that was my, those were my first two questions. Only Rosie O'Donnell and I raised my hand. And uh, I said that I was honest and the place went crazy. So uh, actually they were two of the more interest. They were the first two questions I had. I went through a lot of debates. I went through like 14, 15 debates then. Then we had the debate with uh, Crook and Hillary Clinton. Remember that one? Oh, that, I that was pretty good. He doesn't remember that debate. That was a pretty good one. Crook and Hillary, she was a crooked one. And uh, we had... Uh, what? You want? So, uh, so so politics has been very interesting. It never stops, right? Then we had the debate last time with with Sleepy Joe Biden. How did he do? He was sharp as a tack. I thought I would just like to say I thought you handled yourself so beautifully in that interview. I have to be honest. But for many Americans who have watched as their family members have aged and have experienced dementia, it was difficult to watch President Trump. I think there were a lot of parents that were watching with their children, and there was a moment when he had a very hard time collecting his thoughts, and I just thought that you handled it with such grace. So thank you for that. Well, I was a little, I was a little surprised, and you know, I was surprised by a lot of things. So I, I came on the stage, and I looked at him. I, I, you know, I looked at him just for a brief moment because I really didn't look at him. I didn't want to look at him. I was, I was angry at him because I think he's done a horrible job for the country. I think he's been the worst president we've ever had. And that includes the worst vice president. She's been rated the worst vice president. And don't forget, she was last in terms of getting the job. You know, she competed for his job. And I think they had 22 people or something. And she was the first one to quit. She, she bombed. And she quit, and then all of a sudden she's now running. And from my standpoint, I, I spent a hundred million dollars fighting Joe Biden. And even during the convention, you know, we're only talking about Biden, Biden, Biden. And then we're not fighting him anymore, we're fighting somebody else. He got 14 million votes. I'm not saying he should have gotten it, but I think uh, it seems unfair because a lot of people did a lot better than him. Like, like you had a person, person that came in second and third and fourth, and you know, it's Bernie Sanders actually essentially came in second place, I guess, right? And uh, so you'd say, you know, why aren't you doing a democratic process? So, you know, I'll give them some of their stuff. They are a threat to democracy. They say they are a threat to democracy. So, so she, and she was also, she was the nastiest person to him. Remember, she called him a racist. 
uh, the bus, you remember the story of the bus, you know, the fake story probably. Well, she also said, I worked at McDonald's. Turned out she didn't work at McDonald's. Did anybody see that? After an exhaustive study that took about 20 minutes, they found out, they found out she never worked there. So, you know, there's a lot of fake stuff going on. But we don't need that for a president. And our country can't stand it. We, we are really in trouble. We're a failing nation, whether you like it or not. And I'm sure you don't like it. But we are a very sick nation. We're a failing nation. And on top of it, we have millions of people in here. That they can't, we can't have them. If they were great, if they were... But you're not going to have people where they're emptying the doors to jails and emptying the doors to mental institutions where seriously sick people are coming into our country and you, no country can stand this. There's no country can stand it. So I was not happy with it because, you know, I only did it because I went out of the country. You know, I didn't need this. I had a very nice life. Some of you know, I see some of you in here, you know them. You've known me for a long time, long before politics. I had a nice life. But uh, even running again, if I thought he was good and I thought he was doing a good job, I would have been happy. But he's, not, he's doing a horrible job. And, you know, he's been absent for a long time. If you go back 25 years, he wasn't the brightest bulb in the ceiling, I can tell you that. And he was not doing a job. And, and I've told this, and I mean it, I would have been happy if he were a great president. And I wouldn't have run. I wouldn't have run. I also wouldn't have run if I didn't think I won the election. I mean, I think we won that election by so much. By so much. If I thought I lost, if I thought I lost that election, I absolutely wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't have run because I would have lost the election. But I think we did phenomenally. I mean, honestly, we had millions of more votes than we did in the first election. We did greater than the first one we won. And, and I was told we got 63 million votes in the first election. I was told that if we get 60, 63 million votes, same number, there's no way we can be defeated. I got 10 or 12 million votes more than that, more than anybody had ever got. We got the most votes of anybody, of any sitting president in history. And he beat us by a whisker. And it was a terrible thing. They used COVID to cheat. And it was a terrible thing. And then I watched, and I thought it was very, very sad because of, you know, the election was, it brought great division to the country. But uh, I watched, and I saw how bad they were, how bad things were. I saw the border, the open border and everything. You know, I found out about Tiffany, I found out about the open border when we built hundreds of miles, and then we had a little bit more that I was going to add because there were certain areas that you needed it. And we had everything fabricated, very expensive wall. Those walls are expensive. They're steel, concrete, and rebar. And they have a lot of wiring in them for all sorts of security equipment. But, but it's very expensive stuff. It's exactly what Border Patrol wanted. They have anti-climb bars and everything on them. So we built, we did them. They, it could have been erected in three weeks. And they kept saying, we're not going to do it. We're not. And then I realized they weren't going to do it. And they sold a bunch of that wall for five cents of the dollar. So, you know, that's when I realized they actually want open borders. Because you say to yourself, who would want open borders? Think, who would want men playing in women's sports? But just think of this stuff. Think of this No, but who would want that? And all the things. Kamala Harris, apparently. Yeah. No, she wants it. You know, you, you talk about, like, cars. I, I'm a big fan of Elon, Elon. Gave you tremendous advancement. He's going to send a rocket up to get those people out of there. It's crazy. You know, it's crazy. I said, what are you sending a rocket up? Well, you know, Elon is a very different kind of a guy. As he thinks, he talks. Whereas a lot of people, you know, they want the words to be perfect and all. And they think less and talk more. With Elon, I said, well... You know, I'm doing a new stainless steel hub that can get us around the engines much quicker because there's a problem with the type of engine going into space nowadays. And I'm hearing it. And uh, but in the end, I think 
we can have a new hookup because of the new foils that are coming up. And, and I'm hearing everything that's going through his mind. But he's like, he's a super genius guy. Oh, I loved that conversation that you had on Twitter. I listened oh, to the whole thing. I thought that was absolutely yeah. fantastic. Was, I think we're going to do another one, too. They had a number, like I heard 750 million, but they had a number that was so crazy and large. And we had a good time. We talked for two and a half hours. And uh, yeah, it was the number one ever. There's never been anything like it in terms of people listening or watching or whatever. But, uh, but he's, he's, a great, he's a great guy. But, but I said to him, you know, uh, the one thing is that, and I'm a huge fan of his electric car. I think it's incredible, this car. I think what he does. And I'm a big fan of electric, but they don't go far. And they are expensive. And China does have the material. We have gasoline, more gasoline than anybody else has. Called, called, I call it liquid gold. Liqu- we are liquid gold. But, um, and, and electric absolutely has a place. You know, you have electric, but you have to have gasoline powered cars and hybrid powered cars. And maybe hydrogen is going to be next. Who knows? But, you know, the things that they're proposing. You know, it's interesting. I mentioned men playing in women's sports. So, the Olympics. We watched the Olympics, right? And did you see the boxing situation? Yes, sir, we did. So you had this beautiful champion Italian female boxer, and she was supposed to be very good against women. And I I was watching it for some reason. I find it very interesting. And she was fighting a person that transitioned. And I wouldn't want to fight this person, but transitioned. And, and met certain qualifications. So, so can, can you talk, talk about, about that for a second? Yeah. Because Elon, you're talking about Elon Musk. Elon Musk recently did an interview with Jordan Peterson, and he talked about the fact that one of his children um, has decided that they're transgender. He talked about the woke mind virus. When you look at Tim Waltz, who is now Kamala Harris's running partner, he has made the state a sanctuary city, sir, which means that um, it's a sanctuary state, excuse me, for children, that they can go there and have gender surgeries paid for by the government. And so I just ask you, there's been an explosion in the number of children who identify as transgender, um, and children are being taught that they were born in the wrong body. It's an incredibly abusive message to send. So let's talk a little bit about some of the things that you might be able to do as president. Well, you can do everything. President has such power. He does. He has such power. For instance, you can close the border. You don't need a bill. You know, they keep saying, well, just give us a bill. It's just a bill. They had the worst bill I've ever seen. It was a disaster. And they would have signed it anyways. They do want open borders. They want to have open borders. They want to have all sorts of things that almost nobody in this room wants. Who I think 85, 90 percent of the country doesn't want if they actually want it. But uh, the transgender thing is incredible. Think of it. Your kid goes to school and comes home a few days later with an operation. The school decides what's going to happen with your child. And you know, many of these childs, 15 years later, say, what the hell happened? Who did this to me? They say, who did this to me? It's incredible. Just to finish that boxing, so the Italian girls, and the left is not a hard punch for those of you not into pugilistic affairs. But the left is just sort of a guarding punch, right? So she's fighting this person that transgender, and the guy, boom, hits her with the left. It was like she got hit by a horse. And then she, she backed up. It was weird. She sort of like, and then he hits her with another left, and she said, that's enough, I can't take that. He ended up winning the gold medal. And there was another one who also transgendered, and he or she, she, ended up also willing to go. I don't want to he. <laughs> <laughs> Tiffany said it, I didn't. See, I'm a politician, I have to be politically correct. I'm a mom, I have to protect my kids. No, but think of it, so... The two people, the transgender, it's, the whole thing is crazy. Have you seen the swimming records lately? Have you seen, how about the weightlifting records? That's one of the best. You know, a, a record that was like for 18 years, 
They put a quarter, quarter of an ounce, ounce on one side, quarter of an ounce, ounce, a little bit on one, a little bit. I think the health for 18 years. This guy walks along at 40 feet, they reckon about 150 pounds. Of, it's crazy. The volleyball, we're a, a, a championship volleyball player is playing against a team, and one or two of the people had transitioned, and the ball was hit so hard into the head of the other girl on the other side that she was knocked out and had a concussion. And she said, if she was a championship player, like an all-American player, she said, I've played volleyball all my life. I've never seen a ball travel with that speed. It's crazy. And even with all of that, they won't change. And you know what? Everyone's afraid to talk about it. Not even the people, <laughs> not Tiffany, not Tiffany. We're going to fight to keep our girls safe, President Trump. We're going to fight to make sure that our girls have privacy and safety in their bathrooms and that they have, their, that they have, like, Christy Nome, I think, said it best. She said, we will not allow mediocre men to beat extraordinary women. Yeah. That's right. It's also very demeaning to women. I don't know how they get away with it. But the Olympics was the best thing that I've seen because you really see when these boxers came out, it was so ridiculous. And they just go through it like nothing. And why should women have to swim into Why should women have to compete? Now it was sort of hard to get in. I don't know how these two people got in, but they got in. Because in some cases, you know, they weren't allowed in. So they have a crazy standard going on. But it, it's so demeaning to women. And women are working so hard to like make a team or to, or to make a record. record. And, and these, these records, records that are being set, you know, set now by people that transitioned will not be broken right. maybe, maybe a thousand years, years from now by a woman. I don't know. But, but they're not going to be broken by a woman. It's, it's a very, it's, it's a very sad thing. And, and you know, Kamala is totally in favor. Now, she's she gone away from everything. You know, she's called the greatest flip-flopper in history. She loves uh, fracking now. She said, there will never be fracking. We will never frack, frack, frack. And she, everything that she said would do, she's not doing it. There's like 12 or 14 things. There's never been anything like this. And you know, in one way, it makes you very dishonest. Because, you know, if you could, I could see somebody throughout history, people have gone into one or two areas where there's a difference. You know, you like something and then all of a sudden it's... But almost every single thing, in fact, we're seriously thinking about sending her tomorrow a MAGA hat because she loves everything we're doing. So we're going to send her a nice, bright, red, make America great again hat. You should do that. I love, I love, when, I love when J.D. Vance said that he thought maybe she might come out at the debate with a blue suit and a red tie on. That's right. That could happen. It's crazy. So, so President Trump, Trump, you know, our moms are our busy women, and they have families and, and busy lives, right? And many of them never thought that they would get involved in politics and run. Um, you, did you ever think about running for office at other times in your lives? And just some advice, because you come under fire a lot. Our moms are standing for things that often the media attacks them on. We'd love to get some advice from you about running for office. Yeah, so I would say don't do it. <laughs> We want you to run for office. I, I do say this, though. It is nastier to run as a Republican. It is. Now, I'm the ultimate, you know, I mean, uh, they suffer from a thing called TDS. Do you know what that is? TDS. Uh, it's a horrible, horrible terminal disease. It destroys the mind. It destroys the mind before the body, but the body eventually goes. TBS is Trump derangement syndrome. They have it at levels. They can't even stand their life. They can't stand anything. And you know, part of the reason is I won an election, which everybody said couldn't be won. Couldn't be won for a lot of reasons. Number one, he had never done it before. You know, it's not that easy to be a politician. I mean, you have to have some, something. And... We won, and we really did a great job. You know, we had, we rebuilt the military, we gave the largest tax cuts ever, the largest regulation cuts. Uh, in terms of health, we did something that was amazing. We had uh, right to try 
Here we have great, we're the greatest scientists in the world, greatest doctors in the world, greatest laboratories in the world, better than anybody else, much better than China. China is very good, but much better. Acknowledge, and we have uh, things to fight off diseases that will not be approved for another five or six years that people that are very sick, terminally ill, should be able to use, but there was no mechanism for doing it. And I got everybody into a room. The uh, insurance companies didn't want to allow it because they're terminally ill. They don't want to do it because then they'll get sued for somebody dying even though they're terminally ill. The states didn't want it. The uh, government didn't want it, the federal government. Uh, most of all, the doctors and the labs didn't want it because they didn't want to say that we're going to try to make somebody better. They didn't get better. Now everyone's going to say whatever it is doesn't work. And I got them all into a room, everybody, and I said, here's what we're doing. You're going to sign these documents. Nobody's going to have liability. If somebody wants to come, because you know they fly to Asia, they fly to Europe, they fly. If most of them didn't have money, they'd go home and they'd die. It was a hopeless situation. But if they had money, they'd go to Asia, they go to Europe. We have much better technology. And what happened is I got everybody in a room. I said, listen, there's not going to be any liability. People are going to sign a document that they're not going to sue the country, they're not going to sue the state, they're not going to sue the uh, doctors or the uh, medical platforms, they're not going to sue anybody. They just want the drug. And we have saved thousands and thousands of lives. It's amazing. It actually worked out differently. The drug companies now are liking it to a certain extent because it's the ultimate test. Somebody's terminally ill and all of a sudden they get better and it's happening with thousands. And I got that done. They, they've been trying for 60 years to get it done, and we got it done. They don't have to fly away. And it's really had the reverse. People were finding cures to things. That when a terminally ill person, a person that's almost ready to die, goes in and starts taking something, and now all of a sudden that person gets better. It's an amazing thing, and we save thousands of lives. So we did a, we've done a lot of we've done a lot of things. Right. We'll talk about parental rights, if we could, for a little bit. We're a parental rights organization. Um, and we saw Terry McAuliffe lose his bid for governor yeah. in Virginia. Remember that? Yeah. Yeah. He, he, I actually do. And, and he, he said famously that he didn't think that parents should be making decisions about what their children were learning in school. And we believe that every parent has a fundamental right to direct the upbringing of their children, right? And that includes their education. So what do you plan to do at the federal level to help us to protect parental rights and education freedom like school choice? Okay, so I like to say that we're the party of common sense. I mean, we're conservative in all of it. But walls are common sense, right? All of the things we're talking about, no men and women sports, no gender operation. I mean, this, these operations, it's crazy. You know, I don't know if you know, Europe has gone totally away from it now. We're way behind them. They don't do it anymore. And this is just horrible. But who could even believe this is happening? So think of it. You have these parents that end up in fistfights at school meetings, and the parents mean well. They end up getting arrested, put in prison. I, I've seen things, especially Loudoun County, right? Loudoun County, it's a hotbed. Anybody from Loudoun County? You know, I have the property. I have the big, uh, great golf course there, right on the... I all, actually, I offered you had the head of your, one of your groups that was very impressive to me, and I said, any time you want to use my land, along the Potomac River, right under the American flag. I mean, I have sort of an unlimited capacity there. It's a lot of, it's a lot of acres, and uh, it's miles along the Potomac. It's truly beautiful, but, you know, I'm, I'm for parental rights all the way. I don't even understand the concept of not being. Thank you. And, no, but when you see some of the things, when you see some of the things that doesn't, that's another, you know, like, uh, why would someone want to have an open wall? Why would someone, when you see some of the things that, that they want people to do in these school boards, and they become like dictatorships, and the parents are screaming for the life of their child, a lot having to do with transgender, a lot having to do with a lot of other things, you've got to give the parents, the parents truly love the kids, okay? Some of these people on the boards, I think they don't like the kids very much, what they're doing. 
So, so you, you have, have to, to give, give the, the rights back to the uh, parents. parents. And, and I can't imagine it. Well, okay, this administration has been the opposite. This administration, it's like the FBI goes after the people. They're like it's some kind of an insurrection. It's yes, sir. crazy. They call this domestic terrorists, President Trump, Can for speaking out at school board meetings. Well, we'll change, change that on, on the first day, day. I promise you. No, can you believe it? You are not a domestic terrorist or a terrorist. We do have terrorists coming in, and they're coming in by the thousands, but you're not one, Tiffany. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, yeah. and, and, you know, the president can do that very easily. But, but you just wonder, where's the mindset to take the parents' rights? I see those meetings, and it does seem like Loudon has a lot. You know, that Loudon is the ultimate example of it. It's so vocal. But, but uh, tell, tell the, people the people in Loudoun County, County, if you would like, like to be on the Potomac River, beautiful, having a picnic and talking about taking your rights back, where you're allowed to say, could my son study a little bit of arithmetic or instead, <laughs> instead of something else? That, could we teach the kids that to read? Should, that's correct. That's right. Yeah, let's teach them how to read, please. So, uh, yeah, yeah. let them know that. Uh, that would be my honor. Absolutely, well, and thank you for that. We appreciate the support. So, uh, Tina Deskovich, the co-founder of Moms for Liberty, and I, we did a lot of interviews, yeah? And um, there's a lot of international interests, specifically Japan. We get asked for a lot of interviews, and we were talking with a reporter, and we said, you know, why is there so much interest in Moms for Liberty in Japan? And he said, we are watching America's light dim. And we're very concerned, and we want to know what you're doing about it, and you guys are doing something. And so I feel like America is slipping back from the freedom and liberty and the beacon of light that we've been. So how will you take us forward? We're a nation in decline. We are. And it's because of the people that we have leading our nation. We are a nation. You know, I say this, and I said it a little bit in 2016, and I meant it. We had a bad border, but... It was, it was like, like unbelievably good, good compared to what we have now. I mean, we, we had a bad border, but it was a regular bad border. This, this is a border the likes of which has never been anything like it. This is a horrible. You know, many people are killed coming up in the caravans. It's rough stuff. You go through snake country. You go through, oh, it's just these, these, what happens. And by the way, remember I said rape when I first came? Well, rape, rape is... Massive percentages of women are being raped and just beat to hell coming up in the caravans. It's, uh, I mean, I say this, I look, this is a very sophisticated audience. Mothers give their girls uh, big bottles, big, big bottles of birth control pills because they know bad things are happening to their daughters coming up. And, you know, we're allowing it to happen. We're, we're telling them come up, we're going to give you education, we're going to give you this, we're getting them to come up. If you say the border is closed, and it is closed, people aren't going to even come up. Those journeys up, when you talk about death, many people are dying, especially women. Many people are dying on the trips up. They're being mutilated, and it is a nasty. And when I first came, I said, I, I used the word rape. I remember I got Great marks for the speech when I first announced I was running. Remember that? In the uh, lobby of Trump Tower. And two days later, I think the Times called, did you say rape? I got great marks. They said it was a great speech. And then they said, did he say rape? And I said, yeah, I said rape. That's what's happening. Tremendous levels. And after that, it was like, that, that's when it all began. And it was like, Incredible with this. Well, what I said is nothing compared to what the fact is. It is, it is a horrible thing. Those caravans are mean, mean. And you know, you have people, 10 to 20, 25,000 people coming up in these massive caravans. And there's tremendous death and injury and problems that uh, nobody would even believe. And uh, we're, causing, we're causing this. But I did mention that word, and now everyone's saying, you know, Trump was right, Trump was right. But you have to go through hell, and you have to say it. And, you know, I respect you so much, because you speak up. Like you said, no, we're all for that, right? Very few people would say what Tiffany said 
a couple of moments ago about something that was a little bit controversial that shouldn't be controversial at all, but they just wouldn't do it. So when you said that, I said, that's refreshing to hear. I just want to thank you for taking the time to meet with so many of the victims' families of crime that we've seen, Lake and Riley's family, for example. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I'm just going to ask, what is that experience like for you, meeting with the parents of children who are being killed by illegal immigrants? It's terrible. Uh, they're being killed by uh, illegal aliens. You know, there's no correct term because any term you use, they criticize you. You shouldn't use the word alien. You shouldn't use the word migrant. They want to take all the words away so that you can't talk about the subject anymore. Basically. Exactly right. But uh, Lincoln was this beautiful young woman who was savagely beaten and killed by uh, a migrant. And but there are many of them. There are many of them. I can tell you the parents will never be uh, will never be the same. I had it. I was at the border three days ago with uh, three people. Two where their child was killed, one where she was badly injured, beautiful woman. She was uh, badly, badly hurt. Uh, they stole a car. She tried to stop them and they ran her over and this and that. She was, you know, thought she was gonna be dead, but she had a terrible fracture in the head. And uh, I mean, I had a case that was very interesting. Uh, the uh, 13 people that were killed in Afghanistan, you all know, about that. That was grossly incompetent. Getting out was fine because I was going to get out. I would have been out before then, but we had an election that happened. Uh, but we would have been out with dignity and strength. We would have taken the military out last. Not first, they took the military out first. But they had 13 people killed, and I got to know many of the families of the 13. It was a terrible, tragic thing. None of them should have died. Those people were essentially killed by a stupid administration that didn't know what they're doing and, and bad generals like Millie, who was a bad general. Bad general. And, you know, nobody was fired. It was the most incompetent. I think it's the most embarrassing moment in the history of our country, the way it happened. You know, remember the planes taking off and people falling off the planes. Many people fell to their death. They were hanging on to the wings. You know, they probably thought they could take the plane and fly on the plane. And they didn't realize the plane's going 500 miles an hour. And uh, they fell, fell off at 3,000 3, feet. That's three, three times the height of the Empire State Building. They fell off. They started falling off, and then they all were off. And a lot of people. But it was a horrible, horrible moment. But uh, you had 13 people killed, many people badly injured, meaning no legs. We had one, uh, no arm, no legs. And the arm that was left was battered. Face was badly hurt. And these are people, you know, this, this is just horrible casualties. But I got to know the people, I felt very badly, and they viewed me as their president, frankly. They, and I don't want to do anything about it. I don't want to say that, but they viewed me. And I, I, I you know, everybody knew because it was covered, but shouldn't, not covered like the press should cover it. I mean, the press doesn't talk about bad things. I mean, they, they don't talk about what happened in Afghanistan anymore with the Taliban, with, you know, with that horrible leaving. It wasn't the leaving. It was great to leave because, you know, they were there for like 20 years and we were leaving, but we were going to keep Bagram, which is one of the biggest Air Force bases in the world. And we were keeping it not because of Afghanistan, but because of China, because it was one hour away from where China makes its nuclear weapons. So we were keeping that. And it would have been fine, but we, you know, it was time now to turn it over. Despite the threat to democracy, I didn't turn that over. I didn't, I didn't say, you know, they said, you'll never give it over. These people are crazy. They're crazy. But anyway, so I gave it over, and they, they, then they took it over. And I didn't have anybody killed in Afghanistan for 18 months. I had a long talk with the head of the Taliban, who's really the boss. And his name is Abdul. And I said, Abdul, don't do it. Don't do it. And you don't do it. And he said, uh, but why, why, sir? Why do you send me a picture of my home? Uh, Abdul, you'll have to figure that one out. 
But why, but why do you send me a picture of my home, Your Excellency? Call me Your Excellency. And he was fine. Look, I said, you can't, uh, you can't, uh, you hit any dead snipers that were killing our people. Our, our wonderful uh, soldiers, you know, snipers from a long distance. And uh, we didn't have lose one person in 18 months. And then we had this catastrophe happen, which it should have never happened. We had them in good shape. But we had to get out. It's ridiculous that we were there. And we left $85 billion worth of equipment. You know, they became brand new equipment, too. Equipment that I bought. They left brand new goggles, tanks, planes. We left it there instead of taking it out. I remember when Milley told me, General Milley, he's one of the woke guys, you know, he was saying, you, you know all about him. He's bad, he's bad general. But he was saying, sure. I think we should leave the equipment behind. I said, why? Because I was talking about getting out. And I was going to get out. I brought it down to the number of men, but we had to keep Bagram. You've got to keep the Air Force, the big base. Built many years ago for billions and billions of dollars. I said, sir, we should leave the equipment behind. Why? Well, it's much less expensive. I said, wait a minute. We got a $150 million airplane, and we could fill it up with a little gas, a little a tank of airplane fuel and fly it to Pakistan or fly it all the way back home. You think it's cheaper to leave it? And it's a new plane? You think it's cheaper? You think it's cheaper to leave army tanks so we can put them in a trailer? And take them? Yes, sir. It's cheaper. I said, this guy is really bad. It's true. And that's what I lost total respect for the guy. I didn't have a lot because you, know, you never got good news. I want people where there's good news, you know? Like the general I used to knock out the you know, I knocked out 100% of ISIS. It was supposed to take five years. It took about four weeks, right? We have a great military. I tell you, we have a, I had a great general in charge of that. And he knocked the hell out of him. He said, sir, I can do it in about four weeks. I said, why didn't they do it before? Sir, they didn't want to really fight. They wanted to be politically correct, sure. Uh, but uh, it, it was amazing. We have, you know, I just say to this room, we have a great military. And our military, our real military is not going to be woke. You couldn't convince them to be woke if you screwed at them all day for the next 10 years. But, you know, but the guys on television are woke, and a lot of the top people are woke, but they'll all be gone pretty quick. They're going to all be gone. You get them out. You get them out. When I was in Milwaukee, I got to meet some of the Gold Star families. And so, they, yes. what? Yeah, yeah, we had a big problem. Uh, so I was called by these families, and there were probably four of them. There was also somebody very badly injured with, with the legs and everything. And they asked me, would it be possible, two days ago, right, to go to Arlington National Cemetery to celebrate the life of their children who had been killed uh, three years ago. And this was the whole thing, the whole disaster in Afghanistan, where they set off a bomb and probably 500 people were killed all together. And we got to think of the other side also, but it was, it was a terrible thing. But we lost 13 soldiers. We had 45 soldiers that were really badly hurt, too. You know, nobody ever talked. You ever notice somebody loses their leg or both legs or their arm, in one case an arm and two legs, and nobody ever talks about them. They talk about it because we have to remember that those people are... Dead. Nobody ever talks about them. And we had some people that were horrifically injured. Anyway, they called and they said, Sir, would you be able to come? Now, I got to know them because I have a place in Bedminster, New Jersey, which is a spectacular place. And they wanted to know whether they like New Jersey. They, New Jersey is good. New Jersey is some of the most beautiful things. But, so this is a beautiful place. And I had most of the families uh, there about a year and a half ago. And they all wanted to know whether or not I'd be showing up. I didn't know if I could. And when I heard they were there, I, I went out and I saw them. And they thought I was going to stay for five minutes or ten minutes, shake everyone's hand and leave. I ended up staying with them like for four and a half hours. We listened to music up with the members. We had this beautiful deck overlooking everything. And you're looking at the sky, great food, a very luxurious place. I mean, beautiful. 
And we had, I don't know, like 20, 25 people, you know, members of, of the family of these 13 people, or most of the 13. And we ended up listening to music, Elvis and Elton John and everybody. And certain songs were very sad, and I point to this guy, I said, your son, your son is looking down at you, and he's very proud. Oh, the, the people, it was like crazy. I was with him like for four and a half hours. My, my 15 minutes, do you think we could get him to stay for 15 minutes? Could he sign something, a picture of my son? So I ended up saying that, and I got to know him. And I got a call a little while ago, like a week, two weeks, and they asked whether or not it would be possible to go to Arlington National Cemetery two days ago. And also, could I say for the uh, changing of the guard and the whole thing, which was beautiful, I did that. And, but it was very tough for me to get there because I was doing something else. I had to get out of something that was not easy to get out of. And I did that, and I did the changing, and then they said, could you come with us to the graves? Of, which is quite a bit away. You know, I had to go into cars and go into, you know, through the cemetery, beautiful Arlington Cemetery. And I did that, and I was getting absolutely killed because they're calling me and they're saying, sir, we got a lot of people waiting. I said, don't worry about it, let them wait. And I did it. And they're looking at the graves and they're explaining. One of the, the mothers was saying, and I, I've had this a lot, actually. Uh, Sir, could I tell you about my son? Yes. He said, Sir, he was a good football player. He was a quarterback. He had a very strong arm. And you know, he was playing another team, a bop, a bop. And this was, and it was a long story, and I just listened to it because I saw the, it was like therapy. She was so proud of him. Oh, they loved you so much, President no, Trump. There's such wonderful things to say about you when we spoke. So we well, really appreciate it. It was so good. But just a bit, so they said, sir, could you take some pictures with us at the graves of our child? And, you know, the, chi the child, because the child, maybe 22 or 24, but that's their child, right? They're not saying uh, at the grave of the man. You know, there's nothing political or... Anything. This was their child. This was their baby. Could you take a picture with it? And, and these people are deaths. These people can never ever be the same. And it was all because of Biden. Okay. I'll get in trouble. I don't care. Get me in trouble. This should have never ever happened. Nobody should have been killed. They should have left from Bagram, which is this massive base. They shouldn't have left from this little local airport where the whole city ended up piling in and everyone went crazy. And, and by the way, they shouldn't have taken the military out first. They should have taken the military out last when everything was done. They took the military out. And I could just imagine Abdul, who's smart as hell. Somebody went to Abdul and they said, Abdul, Abdul, the American soldiers have left. He said, you're a stupid man to say that. Of course that didn't happen. No, Abdul, they've left, they've left. I could just see it, the conversation. Then he found out they left. He said, I can't believe it. And once they left, they had a field day. What they did to us was incredible. But they kept everything. But thanks. Uh, the people were coming up to me and said, Sir, could I have a picture of you at the grave of my son? I said, Absolutely. I would love to do that. So the whole family gathered around. We had the, the beautiful you know, stone, the uh, marble. With the name of the soldier on, shouldn't have been on it because they shouldn't have been dead. And we took pictures at the different grave sites, and that was it. It was beautiful, and they were all crying. Everybody was crying. You know, it was a very sad. They're terrible, terrible. It's even worse when there was no reason for it to happen. You know, it makes it even worse. It's one thing, it's a war, but here's the thing: it shouldn't have happened. Just in, incompetent. It was the most embarrassing day in the history of our country, but it shouldn't have happened. And these kids shouldn't have been uh, dead. And the 45 people that were so badly hurt, and, the, and frankly, the 300 people, mostly civilians from the other side, they shouldn't have been dead. Just a grossly incompetent group of people. So, thank you for respecting our dead, Mr. President. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Just to finish, uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. So, but just to, just to finish. So I took, I took pictures. I, I said to people, I told the story once today. 
I said, should I tell it? Because I think it's a terrible thing. So I stood with the mother's father, sometimes both, sometimes a sister. There was a sister, who, beautiful sister, who also had some difficulty because of a war injury. But I stood with different people over different graves and took pictures. I didn't want to take pictures, but I wanted to take them if they wanted to take them. And I, you know, I'm the former president of the United States is with them. They're very happy about that, as happy as they can be, because they'll never be happy. And I took pictures. And that was it. And I left and we said goodbye. And it was beautiful, actually. And then I get a call that night. Sir, uh, we're getting a complaint from the White House that you used the soldiers for publicity pictures and for public relations. And I said, I can't believe it. And I said, I can't believe it. So here's a guy that he killed, he killed those people, okay? These people were killed by Biden as far as I'm concerned. And then I get, and I get a call, and I'm taking pictures. These are pictures with parents, et cetera, sisters, brothers, people that are laying in the ground right there, shouldn't be, shouldn't be dead. And I get a call, and I actually get a lot of bad publicity. They said, uh, Trump, uh, President Trump, spent time at Arlington National Cemetery taking pictures of things. It's just so disgusting. And I'll tell you, if you haven't noticed, I get a lot of publicity. I don't need that publicity. I don't need that publicity. It doesn't, I get a lot. I get too much. I'd like to have half the publicity. I want to hire a PR person to get me half the publicity, all right? But no, I just, I, you hire PR people for. But I, I, just thought, I just thought it was such a terrible thing. So it's, I just want to tell you, I think, think it, it meant an incredible, incredible amount to them. I know it did. They've spoken about it. And thank, thank you for loving the American people. Thank, thank you for working to make America great again. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you. we thank you for your time today, spending time with us. I want to tell you, Moms for Liberty is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization. Yeah. Um, and we only endorse the school board races. But I want to tell you personally, sir, that I endorse you for president of the United States. Oh, wow. Thank you. That's very nice. Wow. I didn't even expect that. Thank you, Tiffany.